Welcome back everybody. Today I'm going to go through ASPI 14 which is all about planetary rings and in particular we're going to look at Saturn's rings and uh, visualize the rings of Saturn uh, in Matpot Lib and then we're going to calculate the Roche limit of some of the uh, the moons of Saturn and I'll explain more about that later. So uh, to start with I'm, I'm just going to import these modules that that we're going to need at the top so we've got things like NumPy uh, to so that we can use arrays, pandas so that we can open our CSVs, matplotlib for our plotting and so on. Okay, so if you haven't already before you actually start this activity, have a think about those predictions. Uh, what are planetary rings made from? What happens if a satellite gets too close to its parent planet? And do all planets have rings? And then here there's a little space for, for me to write some of my predictions. I'm not going to do that now, but go ahead and, and write yours down somewhere. Okay, so to start with, uh, we're going to use data uh, from NASA on the ring structure of Saturn. And uh, I've actually included this file, Planetary Rings, uh, which has the data that we're going to look at. So you can actually uh, see this outside of Python if you go into the, the file tree on the left if I go into my data directory and then you can see there's a lot of data files here that you can uh, have a look at and there's some text files to explain what's inside here we want to look at planetaryrings.csv so if I find that and I double click on it, it should open up and here you go so I have the object Saturn notice here there's more than one row for Saturn and that's because there's more than one ring so here we have the ring name, a simplified ring name, and, and that's just so that uh, it plots on uh, matplotlib easier. You can see for Uranus here and um, I think Jupiter, no, just Uranus, that I've included some, uh, some latex uh, equivalent names so that it renders properly when plotted using matplotlib. But then you have things like the min and the max, okay, and, and the min and max are to do with the extent of the ring itself. So where does the ring start? Where does it finish? You have a width, an upper and a lower bound on the width of the ring. You have the optical density, which is sort of how, um, how thick it is, how dense it is. And then lastly, DF lower and DF upper. Where df is for dust fraction, so how much of that ring is is made up of dust? And again, you have a lower and upper bounds. Okay, and notice that for some uh, of these rings, the data is missing. For some, there is no lower and upper bound, so there's the same number in both of these. So here for this ring, for Uranus, both the upper and lower bounds for the uh, ring are forty, so there is no. Um, there's no range in within the data that I've collated. If you want to see where I took this data from, you can open up the planetaryrings.txt file, and that has information about where I collated this data from. Okay, so let's go and try and uh, load this into Python. So this part of the code we actually don't need to change anything for. Uh, this will just load in our file, uh, read it in as a pandas data frame, and then print the head of the file. So if we run this, you should see the first five rows of that CSV that we just had a look at with some of the rings of Saturn. Notice how those blank cells, because we didn't have any notes for Saturn in that last column, appear as NAN or NAN. Okay, so now uh, we're going to look at Saturn. So let's just get the data for Saturn only. And then we're going to get the the names of the rings, the inner and outer uh, radii for those rings and so on. So here we want to locate rows where our object is equal to Saturn. So here if we get rid of where it says your code here. We want to put in df and then object. So if we, if we go back up very quickly here, look, this is our object column. So we want this column to equal Saturn with a lowercase s. Okay, so that should select all of the rows where our object is equal to Saturn. So now we need to get the, the names and the ring radii, which is uh, min and max in our uh, code. 
and then we need to calculate an optical density uh, because we're going to use the optical density of the ring to set the transparency in our uh, picture, so how see-through it is. So here, let me get rid of your code here, and then we want the simplified name. So here we're going to uh, select the column which has a ring underscore name underscore simp as its as its header. So that's selecting all of those simplified names for plotting. Okay, and then we want the, the inner value, the min value for the ring. So here we're going to go Saturn underscore rings. And then we want to select the min column dot values. And then the row below, it's just going to be the same Saturn underscore rings. And this time we want the max value. Okay, perfect. So now here it says for the optical density, take an average of the lower and upper columns. And this is just because for some of these rings, there's quite a big uh, difference between the actual upper uh, bound and the lower bound of the optical densities. So here we'd, we'd want to uh, take an average. So we're going to end up dividing by two. And uh, so we're going to add the upper and the lower. So if we do Saturn rings and then let's uh, let's get the upper first so OD and then upper and then we want to add Saturn rings and then OD lower Okay, and then that just extracts the values from it. And if we print Saturn's rings at the bottom, that's just going to show us our reduced data frame where we only have rows which are uh, which have the object Saturn. So only the rings for Saturn. So if we shift enter, there we go. So you can see we've got eight entries for Saturn with all of these different rings and the Cassini division uh, there is its own row. Okay, so if you scroll down, uh, this is a piece of code that I've added in to scale the ring transparency on our plot uh, based off the optical density of our ring. So the higher the optical density, the less transparent, so the more opaque. And I've, I've just selected all these numbers uh, based off what, uh, what looks best when, when I went through this the first time around and made my image. So you don't actually need to change anything here. So all we're doing is creating an empty list for the transparency or alpha values. And here I'm saying, well, for each value in, in the optical density list, if I is greater than one, append one, because you can't have a transparency greater than one. And then we have some uh, ELIF statements. Well, if this transparency is less than this number, well, add a transparency that we're going to plot of 0.025. If it's not that small, but less than 0.01, then I just want to times it by 100 to make it a bit bigger. And, you know, if it's greater than 0.01, uh, and if it's greater than 0.01, but not bigger than 1, then I want to append uh, I times by 1.8 to make that a bit bigger as well. And again, I just, you know, I did this through trial and error to see what looked best. This certainly doesn't scale proportionally. Um, if I did that, then we wouldn't actually be able to see some of those rings with very low optical densities. So I'm going to shift enter on this so that we have our list of alphas and you can see them at the bottom here. So we have our third ring here, which has a transparency of one. So that's going to be a solid color. And if we go back up, we see what uh, division that is. So that's here, look, so that's the ring B. And you can see here the optical density, the upper limit was five and the lower limit was one. So again, the average was greater than one. So we bump the alpha value down to one because we can't have a transparency greater than one. Okay, so we're going to start doing our plot now and we're going to plot these rings as, as circles. So we're going to use the circle artist for this. 
So let's just start by setting up our plot. So we've got a figure instance being set up here. This is going to be uh, number one. And then we can change this. We want a subplot. So plot dot subplot one one one. And then I've set up this Z order counter. Now this just makes sure that the next circle we plot is underneath the last one. So we're plotting from the planet outward. So we're going to put in a circle for Saturn which is going to be, you know, show where the planet is. And then we're going to plot circles underneath to show the rings. So here we've got uh, the radius of Saturn. We need to put that in. So if I paste that in there, I, I know what the radius of Saturn is. OK, so in, in uh, its diameter is uh, 120,536 uh, kilometers. And we want the radius. So I've just halved that. And then we can plot the circle for Saturn on our figure. So here we're using a circle artist. So circle is equal to circle, starting the circle at 0, 0. So having the center at 0, 0. And then here, well, we just need to put in rad for our radius of our circle. And that part's done. And then color, now color, I, it doesn't really matter, but I find that uh, the goldenrod color is is good uh, nice yellowy color for Saturn and then the Z order well it's just going to be Z we'll put it as Z alpha is one we want this to be a solid color we don't want any edge to our circle so now axe dot add artist circle will actually uh, add the circle to the plot and then the last thing we need to do is take one away from Z so minus equals one and that's to ensure that the next circle we plot gets plotted underneath this one. And then I've just ha added some extra bits to set the limits of the axes uh, to make sure that it does plot a circle. It's not squashed. We've got set aspect equal and then axis off because we don't really care about the numbers on the axis right now. We just want to visualize uh, the size of the rings together. So if I shift enter on this, there we go. We've got a circle in the middle that's Saturn and we're going to start adding our rings around it now okay so if we go down here we have a, a piece of code which is going to add two circles the first is going to be a, a white circle from the inner radius of a ring and then the second circle is going to be the colored circle and using those together we can form we can form a ring if I added just a colored circle underneath then it would fill in all of that circle all the way towards Saturn which we don't want we still need to show the thickness of it so we're going to have a, a white circle first and that's going to have a radius which is equal to the the inner radius of the ring and then we're going to put in a colored circle and you'll see what I'm I'm trying to describe in a second so I've just jumped up back to this third code block that we ran because here is where we defined the inner and outer uh, ring radii. So we're going to need to refer back to inner and outer when we're plotting now. So if you go back now to where we were earlier here, so this is going to be inner. So get the inner radius of this ring and the color well, this color is going to be white, as this is our white circle. And then the Z order is just going to be Z. And then edge color we can keep as none. We don't want any of these circles to have edges. So again, add the artist and then remove one from Z. And then we're going to add the second colored ring. So here we're going to use, instead of inner, we're going to use outer and then I. Here the color, we, we want it to be uh, similar to Saturn. So let's just do goldenrod again. Here the Z order is going to be said again. Now alphas was that list of transparencies that I made earlier. So I'll leave that. Edge color is none. That's fine. Add the artist to our plot. So add the circle to our plot. Take one away from Z so that the next white circle gets plotted underneath. So effectively, we're building up layers. We had that circle, that colored circle for Saturn in the middle. 
then we've got a white circle underneath, then a colored circle, then a white circle, and it keeps layering up. Okay, so here we actually want to put names of these rings on as well. Okay, so here it says get the middle of each ring and plot the name there as text. So to do that, we need to use axe.text. We need to know where on the axis to plot these text uh, labels. So TX is going to be the X position. Y is zero. So it's going to plot along the X axis. And here, uh, TX, we need to add something in here. So get the middle of each ring. So if you remember there was an inner and an outer, well, we can use that to get the middle uh, value. So let's uh, let's do outer outer I minus inner. And then we're going to uh, divide that by two. And outer minus inner is, is the width of the ring. OK, so here I'm getting the width of the ring and then dividing it by two. So that's going to give me uh, where the middle is in the ring. But I still need to add the inner radius of the ring. So it's outer minus inner over two. So the width divided by two plus the inner radius of the ring. OK, and I've added a little fix in for the position of the E ring, um, because when I did it the first time, I found that it just wasn't in the right place. So that that was uh, put in by me manually after I I'd, I'd written this code to do it automatically the first time round. OK, so now we can just run this code. So if I shift enter. And voila, so here we have all of our rings nicely done. You can see what I'm talking about here. So there's a white circle right next to Saturn here. And that just blocks off this pale, uh, pale peach, if you like, circle here for this first D ring so that the solid color didn't extend all the way to the edge. So you can see the gaps uh, between the rings. And we've got our nice labels across here. So now we've got all of our rings plotted and you can see that I have actually set the limits of this plot so that we don't see most of the E ring because the E ring extends out much, much, much further than we've plotted here. And if we'd plotted the whole of the E ring, we actually wouldn't have uh, seen the the interior, all of those other rings D to G, uh, they would be too small on the on the plot. So I've purposely chosen the limits so that a lot of the E ring is cut off. So here we're actually going to look at plotting where the moons are now because the moons play an important role in forming some of the gaps in the rings and the dynamics of, of Saturn's system. So here we have another file. Uh, so it says moon file is in data. We were still in data on the left here. Saturn's moon. So let's have a look at that for a second. So Saturn's moon CSV. And here you can see we have the name of all the moons of Saturn, the semi-major axis, the period, eccentricity, inclination, mass, whether it's got an associated ring, etc. So we're going to use this to uh, plot those moons onto our uh, figure that we just made. So here I'm just taking this CSV, opening it up into a pandas data frame called moons. And then what I'm what I'm actually doing here is selecting all the moons in this line, uh, which have a semi-major axis of less than Enceladus. So if we go back to the CSV, we see, oh, sorry, wrong one, Enceladus here. I'm actually selecting all of the moons which are closer to Saturn than Enceladus. Um, and that's just because any other moons, they wouldn't be shown on our graph because of the limits that I chose. So here we go back to the rings, this line actually gets rid of all of those moons further out than Enceladus. So here I get the names of the moons. I get the semi-major axis. So that's uh, going to help us plot them on our graph. And then the diameter of the moon, because I want the uh, plot to scale the size of the moons based on their diameter. So let me go and, and shift enter on this and we should see that we have all of the moons which are closer to Saturn than Enceladus, including Enceladus here, and all the data that we might need for it. 
Okay, so now we have uh, those first 13 moons, okay? So we could just plot them, you know, all in a straight line, but that'd be very boring, um, and also it would look, look a bit forced. So actually what we're going to do is we're going to plot them um, at the correct distance away from Saturn, but uh, randomly, so in a random position in their orbit, if you like. So this is what this uh, piece of code does. So define moon position, and what it's going to take is the semi-major axis, and it's going to return an x and a y coordinate that we can plot this moon at. So the first thing I've done is define a seed, and this is just um, something that's used by Python to generate a random number. And I've set it as one so that each time I run the pieces of code, uh, it's it actually gives me the same random numbers. So I can guarantee that they'll all plot in the same place every time I run this code. And that just helps, you know, make sure that text doesn't shift to um, dodgy places where it's not, it's not readable. Okay, so here we have uh, RANs then, and uh, we're going to uh, create a list for this. And so we want a value, a random number, uh, for each semi-major axis here, okay? So all we have to do here is generate a random number using random for i in, and then we want one for every uh, semi-major axis. So for i in range, the length of a. Okay, so give me a random number for every semi-major axis. Now here, because uh, we want to see where in its orbit is, well, an orbit can go all the way from you know, zero degrees around the whole circle to 360 degrees. So we're actually going to times our random number by 2 pi. So if you remember that uh, 360 degrees is 2 pi radians. So here, rands is numpy dot as array, rands, and then we want to times it by 2 and also times it by numpy dot pi. So then this gives us a random angle from 0 to 2 pi. And we can use that to calculate x and y positions of, of this moon using trigonometry. So here we have uh, numpy dot multiply. So multiplying, and uh, in this case, we want, we want to multiply a. And in both cases, we'll have a in this part of the code. And then we'll take this to be the numpy dot cosine of those random numbers. And for the y position, we'll have numpy dot sine of those random angles. And then it just returns x and y. So here we're using this function that we've just written to return the x and y positions of the moon so that we can plot them. So if you shift enter on this now, and there you go, we have our moon positions. So now we can add these moons as scatter plots to our figure. So here, for i in range len moons, so for each moon, we're going to plot it. We're going to scale the size of the, the scatter point based off the moon diameter. And uh, here we have to remember some, some special things that the size must be a list. So we're going to have to create a list with just one element in, okay? So here, axe.scatter, right? Well, the first piece we need to enter is the x position. So moon underscore x i. And then our y position, so here moon underscore uh, y i, no edge color like before. S, the size, right, well this is going to be uh, the moon diameter, so moon underscore diameter, and that needs an i as well. Uh, color dark gray, z order 31, now z order 31, just make sure this plot above all of the uh, rings, okay, because we started at 30 for our z order, and now if we place all of our moons at z order 31, then actually they're going to plot in the correct position. Now here, this just shifts the text labels that I had down at the bottom, so that actually um, they're correctly offset from the moon, so they don't appear right on top of the moon. So here we need to add the code to the text command, sorry, to the text function, so here we want text x, and here we want text y. 
and here is where we actually want the text that's going to be plotted so we have to remember what we called that variable with the names in so moon underscore names so add that in here moon underscore names and then i okay so hopefully if we run this it should plot all our moons on perfect so here we can see now that not only have we got all the rings and all of the names of the rings plotted on, but we have all of the moons uh, up to Enceladus down here at the bottom with their labels and all of that, uh, that shifting of this text up here is just to make sure that the actual name, the label of these moons is far enough away from the actual scatter point that it's that they're not on top of each other uh, you can see it just down here in Aegean and Anthe the label is quite close to the point and in fact Janus is the same so I've just shifted some of that text further away okay so now we're going to look at something called the Roche limit so if a moon gets very close to its parent planet it can actually be broken up by the forces the tidal forces acting on it so the side of the moon that was nearest to the planet has a greater force on it and a greater orbital velocity than the side which is furthest away from the planet. So if that tidal force is strong enough, it can break up the moon into uh, pieces. So you can approximate how close the moon needs to be for this to happen by using the Roche limit. And the equation for the Roche limit is given there. So 2.44 r, which is the radius of the planet. So that's going to be the radius of Saturn. And that's times by this um, cubed root uh, and it's the cubed root of the density of, of the planet so the density of Saturn divided by the density of, of the moon so what we're going to do is calculate this this limit for Mimas which is the Death Star moon and Pan which is the moon that's shaped like ravioli and then we're going to plot those limits as dashed lines so we're going to still use the circle artist but now we're going to plot them with an edge but as a dashed edge and we're not going to plot them with any filled in color. So here the CSV has uh, no density column. So the line here, moon's density, calculates the density from the mass and the diameter. And um, this is just, you know, calculating the, the volume of a sphere. And the conversions are because uh, the, the mass is, isn't stored in kilograms. And same for the diameter, it's not stored in, in meters. So we have to convert that first. And all the information about the units of that CSV, they're inside the uh, Saturn's moons.txt file down here. Okay, so we're going to need the density of Saturn. And uh, you can just uh, Google this to find this. It's 687 kilograms per meter cubed. So now we can calculate the Roche limits and we can actually do this for all of the um, moons and then print them all at the same time. So if we get rid of this code here and we're going to need our equation. So let me go back up slightly so we can see it. So it's 2.44 and we had the radius of uh, Saturn stored in the rad variable. So rad times by and then here we're going to do the uh, cubed roots like this, so one third. And here we have the density of uh, Saturn, which is just density. And then divide that by the moon densities. And that will give us an array of all of the uh, Roche limits for those moons. So here then, we're just going to print them. So for M and R, so for the moon name and the Roche limit in we'll zip them together, we're going to print them together. So here, we just need to get rid of this uh, inside the print statement. And then I want to print the name and add to it. So add this string to it. So uh, colon, space, and then I'm just going to leave that for a second. And the units will be kilometers and dot format the Roche limit. So the Roche limit is going to go inside these brackets. It's going to format it into a string for us. And um, ideally, we want it as a float. So it's going to have one decimal place here. So 0 0.1 is, is one decimal place when it prints. Okay, so here then it says uh, we want to use a circle artist with face color none, but we want uh, the 
line style so the edge is going to have a line to it now to get a circle with no fill and just an edge we want a z order of 30 to make sure that it actually plots on top of what we already have and we're going to pick a color it's probably going to be gray so here we need to uh, just get rid of this and what I suggest we do is, is look at how we use the circle artist all the way up uh, here, so even further up. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to copy this all the way down so we have something to work off. Okay, so what do we need to change then? So zero, zero is fine. We still want to start it at zero. But here we don't want to plot the outer to limit anymore. This makes no sense. We want the Roche limit for Pan. And Pan is actually the first um, moon. So if we take our array, uh, it's going to be the first element in our array. We don't want it to be goldenrod. Let's, let's do dark grey. Uh, we want the Z order now to be at 30. We don't really want it to be transparent and uh, we want a fill of none. So let's change this to actually instead of EC edge color, we want fill color none. And then we're going to define a line style. So LS is equal to and then we can put these two dashes and that will give us a line. OK, then it's added our artist. So let me just copy this now. And we're going to do the same for Mimas. And if I remember correctly, Mimas is the fifth from last in our um, in our CSV. So if I just put minus five in there, that will give us the correct value for Mimas in our uh, list, in our array of, of Roche values. So here again, don't need to change anything. I might like to change this line style so that we don't confuse the two. I'm going to put colon in, so add the artist, and then we should be ready to shift enter. And fingers crossed. Mondens, I've made a mistake with my spelling. Where's that? Moondens, there we go. Shift enter, perfect. So here you see, to start with, it's printed out the Roche limit for each of the uh, moons up to Enceladus. So you've got them in kilometers here. Okay, and then if I go down here, you've got these two dash lines. One is very obvious next to the G ring. And then there's actually another one which is uh, almost at the edge of the Cassini division in the most golden bit. So he, right round here, I'm trying to trace it out with my cursor, which doesn't show up as well as the other Roche limit we've plotted, but it's, it is here right next to the Cassini division. Okay, some of you might notice that actually the line for Pan is this line by the G ring. So Pan is actually within the Roche limit. And remember the Roche limit was when we said that tidal forces would disrupt the moon and break it apart. And this hasn't happened for Pan. So what's happening? Well, we used the Roche limit for a fluid satellite, which takes into account the deformations. And there's another formula for a rigid spherical satellite, which is slightly different. It's down here. So the Roche limit is the radius of Saturn. And this time there's two inside our cubed root. And we don't have that 2.44 at the start. So actually, we're going to calculate this different Roche limit using, uh, well, the rigid, the solid version for pan. And we're going to see where that ends up. So here, if we want to calculate the rigid Roche limit for pan, we need to get rid of this. And I'm, I'm just going to enter it in. I've already done this. So it's the rad, the radius of Saturn, and then the Q root of twice the density of Saturn divided by moon den zero, which is the first entry of the moon densities, which is for pan. And then we're going to add our circle on. So again, line style, uh, dotted, dark gray, no face color. We don't want it filled in. And here, let me move transparency up to one so that it's easier to see. And then we're going to replot uh, our figure. So here you can see that we've added this extra line in um, just within the boundary, the outer boundary of, of the C ring. So the, the Roche limits are sort of extremes, aren't they? They're quite far from each other. So this is the rigid Roche limit, and this is the fluid Roche limit for Pan. So Pan is in between 
those two limits. So there are a few of Saturn's moons that are in similar situations and they're also getting uh, gradually closer to Saturn as their orbits are decaying. So we think that some of them actually might break up soon um, due to these tidal forces. So the Roche limits are theoretical, they're not absolutes. Okay, lastly down here, uh, it's always good to save your image. So here, fig, save fig, and then you can change this name, call it whatever you like. DPI just uh, says how uh, many dots per inch you want. So if you put it higher, you'll get a larger file out. And the bounding box just gets rid of any white space that um, Matplotlib has put around our figure. So go ahead and save your, your figure now. Okay, and then the last few things, as an extension to this, uh, you might like to try and plot some of the other ring systems which are in those files. And there are there are moon files as well for the other gas giants. So if you just load this, this last image, this is one that I made for Jupiter. Now you can see Jupiter here is this... Um, there's this brown circle in the middle and then it's rings around the outside. This is a lot simpler than Saturn's and uh, we've got it, the, the moons here as well for Jupiter. So I, I would suggest having a go at Jupiter first before you plot maybe Neptune and leave Uranus last because the, uh, the rings for that one are a bit more interesting. Uh, if you see here there are quite uh, a lot of them and uh, most of them do not have a max value so they have a, a min value and they also have a width or two width values so you're going to have to change your code slightly to plot that uh, that ring system okay apart from exploring more the data files that uh, i've provided and plotting the ring systems of the other planets i suggest you have a look at this web page by david simpson so if we uh, go here it's all about the rings of saturn and it, it looks at what we've learned from the Cassini mission, so the lo location of the rings uh, which we've, we've looked at, and then it looks at uh, why are the rings so thin, why is the Cassini division there, sort of the, the history of, of all the rings, how did we discover them, and then it looks at uh, these special moons, shepherding moons and embedded moons, and I mentioned earlier how those moons can affect the, the shape of uh, of the rings and the gaps in between them so you can see here how this moon pandora is affecting the f ring this ring here it's sort of wobbling about so have a look at this web page and then if you are comfortable with python have a look at aspi 15 ring dynamics which delves into particle simulations of uh, of ring particles and looking at how the moons affect uh, the ring systems Okay, that's all from me. Be sure to check out the latest Astronomy and Python challenge on my uh, github.io website or on uh, YouTube. It's all about uh, tides around planets with more than one moon.